Good afternoon, good evening. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Audrey Plunk. I'm the head of the Digital Economy Policy Division at the OECD. I'm very pleased to open today's workshop, which will focus on two very important digital issues that are capturing global attention right now, data portability and consumer protection in online marketplaces. These topics have become significant due to the continued growth in online platforms, which have become critical to our daily social and economic lives, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, where we have all moved even further online. Online platforms offer their users a variety of benefits, for example, the provision of social networking or other online services at no financial cost. In the case of online marketplaces, consumers have access to a wide range of third-party sellers and products. However, concentration of platform providers and diminished consumer choice uh, and widespread problems such as scams and unsafe products being available for sale also present consumers with serious risks. In addition to the increasing reliance on online platforms for our daily social and economic activities and the increasing collection and use of our personal data that comes with it, this has raised significant privacy concerns. These problems have policymakers around the world searching for solutions that protect consumers and allow the proper functioning of markets while fostering an innovative digital economy. These are no small issues. Data portability, for example, can be one tool to promote interoperability across different online platforms. It can increase consumer control over data, enhance competition and innovation, and possibly reduce switching costs and lock-in effects. It can empower users to play a more active role in the sharing and reuse of their data across digital services, online platforms, sectors, and borders. I'm pleased that this workshop will provide an opportunity to officially launch our OECD analytical report on mapping data portability initiatives, opportunities, and challenges, which was released in December of last year. As this report highlights, there are still many regulatory and other barriers to overcome. Similarly, there is work to be done when it comes to enhancing consumer protection on online marketplaces. In particular, we know that consumers often lack clear and easy to understand information about products, who they are transacting with and who is responsible if something goes wrong. It is also important that tools such as ratings and review systems are truthful and not manipulated. We look forward to today to exploring these issues through two interactive panel discussions featuring experts from Colombia and other jurisdictions in the region. They will participate and in particular, share their experiences in navigating these issues in the Latin American region. I would like to thank Columbia for its generous support in making today's workshop possible. I would also like to thank my secretariat colleagues, Time Burden, Andras Molnar, Brigitte Coca, and Christian Reimsbach for their hard work in organizing this workshop. I would now like to invite Alejandro Botero Barco, who is the General Director of Colombia's National Planning Department, to provide a few words to open this special event on behalf of our co-hosts, Colombia. Alejandra, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Audrey, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to speak in Spanish if that's all right. But it's a pleasure to see you, even if it's on screen. I hope we meet before the government finishes in Paris once again. So, um, bueno, primero que todo quisiera agradecer. La... Well, first of all, I would like to thank the OECD's invitation for this very important event in order to be able to share the experience not only from the point of view of the OECD, but also from the point of view of the different academia and regional uh, point of view. Special greetings to Audrey Plank, uh, uh, head of the uh, Digital Economy Division, and to Mr. Aguirre, the head of the Multilateral Affairs in the uh, Mexican Consumer Federal Prosecutors, and Antonino Serralba Ceres, head of Consumers at uh, Consumers International, Federico Dillán, head of the Mercado Libre Central, Pablo Marquez, partner uh, in Colombia, Juan Camilo Duran, superintendent, deputy superintendent at the superintendency of the SIC of Colombia, and the uh, representative of the 4G, and the two uh, panelists 
that are also with us in Green Pass uh, at Tilburg University and Dr. Viviana Vanegas, Head of Digital Development at the uh, Colombian DMP Planning Department, and of course, to all of you that are virtually with us in this event. Online markets, apart from being an issue that is always developing and changing and hence a very important challenge for public policy plays an essential role in the economic reactivation after the pandemic crisis. This led the region in Latin America to have a high potential of growth for e-commerce and the growth of uh, across the border platforms that will not only benefit consumers and citizens in general, but also local businesses due to the export opportunities that arise. However, the data portability is a very important aspect for individuals and organizations to actively participate in the reorganization of their data in the digital services and platforms. According to the report initiatives and uh, challenges uh, from the OECD, portability contributes to interoperability and to increasing data flow in order to have more better competition and reduction in the switch and changes and uh, stay. This is a big challenge in the big in all the governments, not only in relation to privacy and security of the information, but also interinstitutional cooperation between regulators and lawmakers, and above all, the definition of common standards to continue developing the market. Consequently, for Colombia and the other countries in the region, this workshop is very important because we are not stranger to the development of digital economy and the steps to be made in the next few years as challenges not only for the region but for the world. That's why this type of knowledge is fundamental in order to design and execute public policy that are fit for the economy. At this point, very quickly, I would like to share some data that I think could shed some light on the outlook ahead and feed the debate that will follow my intervention. And it has to do with the outlook of e-commerce in the last few years, not only in Colombia, but in Latin America in general. For instance, in Colombia, well, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Chile accounted for more than 90% are the online buyers for 2019. And even though these purchases only represented 1.7% of the region's GDP, around the world, this type of transactions account for more than 5%. In other words, the room for growth and what's coming up in the next few years is very important. Additionally, and according to the e-commerce B2C index, by the Conference of the United Nations on Development and Commerce in 2020, Colombia got a rating of 51.1 over 100 above the average of Latin America, which is 99, and the world, which is 55. For this year, the country had a portability index above Chile, uh, Brazil, and Peru, and the percentage of people using internet above Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, while also changing important, facing important challenges. In fact, in Latin America, digital markets played a fundamental role in the pandemic, not only in the Latin America, but in the world. And the demand of services on digital platforms grew constantly. The service that grew the most in June 2020 compared to 2019 was supermarket purchases with an increase of 259%, followed by food services in 209%. As to, as to packaging and messaging, the increase was 141%. In Colombia 2020, we recorded 29.5 trillion in transactions online, which accounted for a growth of 30% in relation or vis-a-vis -vis 2019, which sales for 22 million pesos. In 2020, there was an increase of online purchases of goods and services of lesser value as goods and services due to mobility restrictions. And these figures of market growth have stayed in 2021. For instance, in the first quarter of 2021, online uh, sales increased 94.3%, second semester 54.9%. And in the third quarter of 2021, they continue increasing or they increase 31.7%. In other words, this market that is already developing has continued moving up, hence the importance of having the same rules of the game and feeding the debate that we will be having. In addition, in Colombia, the digitalization of transactions and access to financial services, mainly to deposit products, were very favorable. 
if we look at 2019, 2020, the number of transactions through digital channels increased 141% and internet transactions increased 30.7% and mobile telephony 171%. We see the importance and pertinence of this workshop on data portability and protection of the consumer in the online markets. This event will have two panels. In the first panel, we will hear about the main points of the OECD report on data portability, challenges, and opportunities. And then we will have important panelists that will talk to us about portability in the financial industry, the national initiative of the infrastructure plan and its application for the common good, among other initiatives. And at last, in the second panel, we will hear from the OECD work on online markets, national initiative for the guide for influencers and education of consumers, trust marts, etc. So we're sure that this workshop will be very useful for all attendees and panelists. So we're looking forward to having you throughout the development of the agenda. I always thank you for your interest in participating in this space. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, very much, Alejandra. I, I want to now introduce my colleague um, who is going to open our first panel. But before that, um, just reiterate that I do hope to see you again in Paris uh, or somewhere else, Bogota maybe, if we ever get on planes again these days. Um, so uh, thank you so much again for your support and cooperation for this workshop. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague Christian, who's a policy analyst um, and an information economist here in the OECD's Data Governance and Privacy Unit. He is going to open our first panel um, and we're gonna dive in deep on the issues of data portability. So Christian, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Audrey, and uh, hello to everyone. I will share my uh, my slides, so please uh, give me a second to to do that. Yes, so this very first session is about uh, data portability, and it is our great honor and pleasure to present to you within this session. Um, the OECD's report on NEPN Data Portability Initiative Opportunities and Challenges that Audrey um, um, mentioned during her uh, intervention. Um, and it's also at the same time a great pleasure to have uh, excellent speakers and experts in the field with us today. So after my presentation, I will give, I will open the floor for um, the intervention of the, the various speakers. So let's start with the, the OECD report on data portability. So here you have, um, this is the report and I share with you here the, the table of content um, because this essentially will be also the, the structure of my presentation. So I will start and this is really, I would say one of the added value of this report is that it does provide a common understanding about data portability, a, a, a definition that we will see. It then talks about opportunities and risks and then focuses on implementation challenges. And then um, I will also highlight uh, future work that is basically how, where we are going with this work. But it's important to mention that this work is, uh, is one of um, a number of works that have uh, reports that have happened in the past. And I will also in particular like to draw your attention on a report on that our colleagues from the competition committee um, has worked on, on data portability, uh, focusing in particular on uh, digital platform competition. Um, but maybe before we start into the substance, why, why, do we, why do we care so much about data portability? Um, one of the ways to look at this is to, to look at how big data is being adopted across businesses. And here you have one of our key statistics um, about um, firms adoption of big data um, across, across um, um, those countries that have provided um, indicators on, on this particular topic. And what you can really see here is the, the big gap between um, uh, big data adoption between large firms and small firms. So essentially you see throughout the countries, even though there are differences in the, in the um, adoption rates what we, between countries, we see that there is a clear um, a difference uh, whereby, for instance, if you look at the Netherlands, which is the very first uh, country here, where you see that uh, business, large businesses, 60% of all large businesses that are adopting big data while only uh, slightly above um, um, or below 25% are, uh, of small business are adopting big data. So there is definitely um, an issue here that policymakers have tried to address, um, essentially how to promote um, the use of big data across the economy 
And one way how to do this, um, because obviously one thing that comes with what we're seeing here is a risk of concentration of data towards um, larger firms. So one possibility to promote the reuse of data, um, including also for small firms has been um, um, data portability. Now, what exactly is data portability? And it, here it is important to acknowledge that um, there are different ways how to promote data access and sharing. And you see on this figure, um, basically a taxonomy that shows different degrees of openness where you may, for instance, um, have open data, which is here referred to as level three um, um, access, uh, open access regime. Um, and in contrast, you have um, discriminatory access by sh sh stakeholders, which is essentially a category that includes also data portability, whereby only specific stakeholders in, in the case of data portability, these are typically the users. Now, the specific definition that we have put forward um, in our report is data portability should be understood as the ability of a natural or legal person, so including businesses, to request that a data holder transfers to that person or to a specific third party data concerning that person. And another requirement is that the data be provided in a structured, commonly used and machine readable format on an ad hoc or a continuous basis. And we will get to that in, in my next slide. Um, what the report also provides as an added value is that it actually provides um, um, different dimensions for which you can you can um, classify different reg data portability regimes because, and we will get to this also uh, in this panel, that different ways how data portability has impl implemented also depending on the sector, financial sector, energy, transportation, and so on. So it's actually important to, 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 to have a, um, a clear understanding how do we structure and define uh, data portability. And you see those different dimensions here. Uh, one dimension that I would like to bring to your attention is the moto, uh, modus of operandi in respect to how data is transferred, namely whether data is uh, allowed to be only downloaded by the third party or by the individual, or whether the data is allowed to be transferred to a third party, which we refer to as data portability 2.0, or whether there is a real-time continuous data transfer that is really then a concept closer to interoperability, which we refer to as data portability 3.0. Now, in our report, we looked at different data portability initiatives dating back to 1996, uh, as you see here on this slide, but also a really recent one. And the most recent one that we looked at was the California Privacy Rights Act, uh, which will um, be enacted in, in 2023. Uh, what is interesting, and this was really um, an eye-opening for us also, and also a validation for this uh, taxonomy, so to speak, is that we can see a, a evolution from data portability 1.0 initiative where you only download the data to more real-time continuous data transfer or portability or regimes that we refer to as data portability 3.0. And if you look, but because I won't go through all examples, but if, you have, if I may pick the last one um, that you see on the bottom, the California Consumer Privacy Act, you see that actually the very first, um, the, 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 the 2020 um, act had on, only, so to speak, um, data portability 1.0 um, uh, covered, but then in a, an additional um, um, follow-up act that complements the California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, namely the California Privacy Rights Act, it in introduced um, um, ad hoc direct transfer as an additional mechanism for, for data portability. So we see this kind of trend and um, as a very interesting development happening. Now, there are a lot of opportunities that comes with data portability. Um, um, in the opening speech, uh, some of these have been mentioned, so I won't go through them. But what I think what is important, and this is what this slide is about, it shows um, the, the fact, it shows that essentially uh, behind every of these opportunities, there are significant risks that policymakers need to take into account. Um, be it, for instance, the uh, unintended adverse effect on market structure, um, be it effect, um, unintended effects on incentives to invest, be it digital security or privacy risk. And the intention of today's panel is actually to discuss some of these risks and also to discuss how to address them. This is my last substantive slide. It, essentially, it shows that really the devil is, as we always know, always in the details. 
Um, and here we, in this report, we actually highlighted some of those detailed area that policymakers that want to implement data portability need to take into account as they, as they proceed. So again, I won't go into the details of each of these implementation challenges. I think we will cover some of these um, during the discussion today. Finally, where are we going with this work? I think it's important um, to inform you, if you didn't already know, that the OECD has um, launched a horizontal project on data governance for growth and well-being, which is structured around four modules. The most important thing that you need to know about this project is that it, it covers, obviously covers data portability, but the nice thing is it, it covers this topic through a competition length, but also through um, the privacy length, um, so we, we are looking at the issue from different perspectives that complements each other, including also consumer protection. Here you see uh, some of the reports that are that I refer to. I will leave it like this, um, and you have the link. We will share the slides with you um, if you want to know uh, more about the work. You have the link. So with that, I would like to invite our other panelists um, to 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 basically activate the cameras and. Um, we will start with the first speaker, um, who is uh, Mr. Pablo Marquez. Uh, Mr. Marquez uh, is a partner at ICIA uh, Colombia and a private consultant and recognized expert in competition law, economic and administrative regulation. And he will now address the topic of data portability um, from a particular perspective of the financial sector, if I understand co co correctly. So um, Pablo, the floor is yours. And thank you very much uh, for being with us. Well, first, uh, thanks, Christian, and uh, the OECD team for, for the invitation. This is a great forum and a, uh, and a very uh, important topic to discuss. Um, I don't know if you want me to speak in English or Spanish. I, I think there is a strong uh, number of, uh, uh, of our audience in Spanish, and there is interpretation. So I will switch to Spanish. Uh, but if at some point you want me to move to English, just let me know. Um, I'm going to share my screen with a very short presentation or to make it very simple. And uh, y ahora en español, um, lo que pretendo uh, explicar muy brevemente en esta But I will try to explain very briefly in this presentation. Es eh, particularmente los. Es particularly eh, the mechanisms that the Colombian government has tried to implement to benefit data portability in the financial markets. And as you'll see on my screen, I wonder if you can see it now. In Colombia, we have called the system open banking or open financial architecture. And in the end, this is a practice in which the bank establishments supervised by the Financial Superintendency of Colombia and others technically open their information systems so that consumers that are using their services have the possibility to share their data with other financial entities or even with third parties that provide services that could be associated to financial information. So technically, these rules that the Colombian government is trying to promote are based on two principles behind them. One, focusing on giving governance uh, to consumers on the data, and particularly those data associated to the construction of their financial digital identity. Or, uh, and on the other hand, to give more competition dynamics in those scenarios where it is considered that a service or where consumers could be benefited with the transfer of their own personal data to other servers that could provide these type of services. The whole model or scheme uh, part of this architecture where it is required, as explained by the regulatory project at the Financial Regulation Unit, it, what is required is to have 
technical mechanisms in order to be able to function pro uh, properly. And these uh, projects seek to provide the financial sector powers that uh, perhaps were not clear in the current data protection framework. The first one is very simple, to give an authorization because the uh, financial activities have uh, limitations in their roles, an authorization to have the possibility to uh, trade and facilitate the circulation of personal data. This is uh, a technical limitation in the regulations that uh, hindered doing this. And uh, this makes it possible to monetize these type of businesses. And with these uh, project and this decree is clear now. And it also provides other elements that are quite important in that the new rules provide for offering products to third parties and from third parties, which in connection with the services of these financial entities, and if they're data intensive, they can use the user's personal data. And finally, that the infrastructure technology will make it possible for these new entities to come in, whether they're supervised or not, to provide these services. So this regulation of the financial architecture comes to this balance point where it can generate more competition, undoubtedly, inside the financial sector. However, the rules are not completely open. The information flows basically go from the financial sector to other sectors or within the financial sector, and they do not necessarily promote more competition because the way in which the regulations are drafted are focused on entities that are supervised by the financial superintendency and this hinders having flows from in both ways therefore it is interesting to see that even though the regulations seek for the financial sector to be more competitive and dynamic through the portability or the use of data for the provision of new services the regulations also close the possibility which is not what the regulations on the protection of personal data are close to having third party services towards the providers of financial services. And this is where we could see a dynamic of competition coming where, for instance, entities that are not supervised could start bringing data from financial entities or organizations or other organizations that are not necessarily supervised by the superintendency that would put the consumer in control of their own data and provide different services, different from financial services. So this is where Christian's points come in, the ones that he emphasized regarding the risks and data portability, which is how to control in an open regime like this personal data who has the information what are the data used for these are the big limitations shown by all the studies of data portability there will always be security issues associated to personal data there are burdens regarding consumer protection that are there but we must also understand that at the end the uh, uh, potential is very important in order to have new services and new approaches in the uh, provision of traditional services. So in this unbalance uh, regarding competition and protection of personal data in having this open architecture, we see that there are limitations because uh, we cannot oblige not supervised uh, organizations to share the data but in Colombia, organizations are already providing absolute control of these information on the user and the consumer. And therefore, these type of new business models where you have centralizers of personal data for the provision of new services are properly protected by the regulation on protection of personal data. So I'm closing here with a conclusion. Data portability at the end of the day ends up being a model 
that allows and promotes competition in the markets, particularly in data intensive markets. And it's an issue or an aspect that will clearly facilitate or enable. I will stop sharing my presentation. I'm sorry. As users of the financial sector, we will have the possibility to have new services, not necessarily financial ones, but based on financial transactions. This is not free uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, personal risks. And as we heard before, the different issues have to be looked at from different approaches. And in this panel, I'm sure that we will be having very interesting discussions on how to protect personal data in the uh, open architecture system. Thank, thank you very much, Pablo. Um, I would like to to um, give the floor to the next speaker, but before I do Me so, I just la hora, el piso, o la palabra al siguiente orador, pero ahora. Quiero recordarles que tenemos la posibilidad de recibir preguntas a, para los panelistas y algunos de ustedes ya han enviado algunas. Y al final del panel eh, revisaremos estas preguntas cuando ya se hayan hecho todas las intervenciones. Me gustaría invitar ahora a la señora Ingrid Greff, que es profesora asociada de Derecho de la Competencia con experiencia en las áreas de derecho de la competencia, regulación y gobernanza e innovación en la Universidad de Tilburg. Me gustaría darle la palabra ahora y me gustaría hacer la conexión acá entre la presentación de Pablo y la tuya. Porque algo que destacó Pablo en su presentación es el hecho que puede haber la necesidad de crear igualdad de condiciones en donde los regímenes de portabilidad de datos no se concentren en cierto tipo de jugadores, por ejemplo, el financiero, quizás en su presentación también. And thank you uh, for being with us as well. Thanks a lot for that kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to be part of this event. Also, uh, indeed, to learn about uh, data portability initiatives in Colombia, because I, for myself, uh, are mainly focused on the developments in the EU. And that's indeed also the focus that I will take in this uh, short contribution. So I will try to focus on uh, the competitive impact of data portability from an EU perspective um, with the objectives that uh, there might be some lessons already to draw from what happened in the EU, how you can set uh, the right framework conditions for making data portability effective, and maybe also for indeed addressing some of the undesirable side effects in terms of uh, competition. So if I start um, at the origins of uh, data portability in the EU, um, we uh, can of course refer to the general data protection uh, regulation, uh, where you already saw at the very beginning that there was a combination of considerations that played a role there. So in this sense, you can also refer to GDPR data portability as having a hybrid nature. So on the one hand, uh, being part of a data protection regime and the fundamental rights nature that comes with it. One of the key objectives of data portability was individual empowerment, so in the self-determination, so giving individuals control over how their personal data was being used and allowing them to transfer their data to another provider. But also at that time already, it was clear that data portability could also have other objectives that are more um, targeted at the internal market. So from an EU perspective, what we want to achieve is uh, having uh, as little boundaries between member states as possible and a free market uh, for personal data also fits within that. And there you also see that uh, data portability by uh, facilitating the sharing and the reuse of data personal data can also indeed have an impact on competition and stimulate innovation, uh, for instance, by using data that was collected for one particular objective in a slightly different way under the control of the individual. 
So here, I think one, uh, one point to keep in mind is that, uh, of course, a lot of um, the implementation of such a right to data portability depends on the legislative text. But what we have also seen is that um, you can also steer the impact of data portability uh, that it has on individual empowerment, but also on competition and innovation uh, by the way it is implemented. And so after um, uh, data portability being introduced in the GDPR, also the EU legislator has um, continued to develop other forms of data portability, uh, where you also now see that there is a bit of a patchwork of different forms of portability, both horizontal, so there I mean cross-sectoral, so the GDPR applies to all personal data, irrespective of whether it comes from the energy, um, or the digital sector, for instance, but there have also been sector specific forms of data portability. Uh, so if you look at this graphic, so this is a, a graphic just showing you some forms of portability that have been introduced in the EU or are about to be introduced. Uh, so apart from the GDPR, there is now also a type of portability that is specifically targeted at, at digital content. So for instance, in the context of video games, uh, lining up with the previous presentation, the EU also has uh, what we call the PSD2, so the Payment Services Directive 2, which is very much based indeed on this idea of open banking. So there you see that it was a very targeted specific type of portability really focused at certain types of financial services, where you also see that there was a strong framework created for the standards to make that form of data portability possible. Then also there is um, within the electricity sector, um, there is forms of data portability being created. And more re recently, uh, we also see that um, the type of portability being introduced in the GDPR is now also being expanded in the Digital Markets Act. And the Digital Markets Act is a piece of legislation that really targets um, the most powerful gatekeeping platforms, as we call them. So think of companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon. And there, uh, the type of portability that the GDPR has created um, is now being expanded for these particularly strong gatekeepers. So in the sense that they now also have to move towards creating a real-time continuous form of portability. So that would be the strongest form of portability that Christian also already uh, mentioned in his presentation. Beyond that, we also expect by the end of this month uh, that the Commission, the European Commission, will come up with a new legislative proposal for the Data Act. And there probably we will, we might see also additional forms of data portability. So this is just to give you an idea that indeed there is different choices uh, being made, different forms of portability that slightly overlap. And this also, of course, has an impact on how, imp how the implementation of data portability in the EU has happened, and also how the competitive impact uh, has been that we have seen so far. And here I think um, it is fair to say that sector-specific forms of data portability um, are so far the strongest. So PSD2, indeed, the financial sector with the move towards open banking, this has created strong standards for uh, portability in the financial sector. And one question that you can ask yourself is whether this type of work, so agreeing on standards, but also agreeing on uh, what would be data formats or how do we interpret some terms relating to data portability, whether this can also this work, whether that can also spill over across industries, so that also the more horizontal cross-sectoral forms of data portability will in the end be more effective because of uh, this strong focus in some sector uh, sectors for developing particular types of portability. So beyond that, I think um, so far it seems that the impact of data portability in the EU is still a bit limited. Of course, the, uh, there are several rights being created. In some sectors, um, you see that data portability has a bigger impact than in others. Uh, and it seems that what is really key is to create effective standards for portability. And there is, uh, for instance, if you look at the GDPR, there is uh, a lot of leeway left up to the industry to set up standards themselves. So the legislator itself has not 
not really uh, interfered uh, in that. And if you look at the competitive impact, I think it's also uh, good to make a distinction between uh, two levels. So I've called this here the micro and the macro level. And this again goes back to the hybrid nature of data portability that I mentioned in the beginning. So if you go to the bottom level here, so this is the level where it is you as a user that can request your data being ported. Being ported. So it's a relationship that you have with a certain provider or with a certain data holder. So uh, invoking that right will empower you uh, to transfer your data to another data holder. But if you look at the macro level, so at the level of overall competition and innovation, there you will only see an effect when many different users at the same time invoke their right to data portability so that it is becoming it becomes easier to switch across services and more innovation based on data starts to occur so in this sense you again see this mix between the different considerations uh, at play and there of course there is also the point of preventing undesirable side effects uh, because one risk of data portability indeed is that it is mainly the incumbents, the biggest firms, firms that uh, benefit from data portability, for instance, because it is easier for them to nudge their users to bring even more data to their services. And here, I think one way to um, address this and to prevent such possible undesirable side effects is to think of uh, introducing asymmetric regulation, so meaning that stricter rules apply to the strongest market players. So in the EU, we already see that in the context of the Digital Markets Act, where it is the big powerful platforms that now have to also uh, facilitate real-time continuous form of data portability. But you can also look at asymmetry um, at the side of the beneficiaries. So meaning that you might want to prevent certain strong firms from having even more data and this indeed in, uh, seems to come back in this data act. So there was uh, a discussion yesterday in the press about what provisions the data act would be. And it seems that one of the provisions could be that gatekeepers under the Digital Markets Act won't uh, be able uh, to benefit from data access or data portability provisions to prevent them from getting even more access to data. And the idea behind this is that by doing so, at the overall level of the economy and the society, you prevent further market concentration. So this could be uh, one mechanism to prevent uh, possible undesirable side effects. Then I would like to uh, end by also uh, pointing at the need uh, for developing proper cooperation between regulatory authorities. And this again ties back to the various considerations that are at play in portability where you see competition, data protection, laws uh, becoming equally important, but also sector-specific regulators like energy in financial sectors that will also have to deal with types of portability. And here you can think of several uh, possible modalities. Uh, for instance, at the very start, consulting each other, who is best placed to lead a certain investigation, Maybe also parallel investigations where you need to think of, are there protocols in place, for instance, to allow uh, regulators to share in, uh, information about investigations with each other. But even beyond that, you could also think of joint investigations or joint design uh, of remedies. And we indeed see initiatives like this uh, in the UK and in the Netherlands, where several uh, regulatory authorities from different fields come together in certain fora or platforms to try to develop these forms of cooperation. So let me stop here and refer you to some uh, references where you can find some of the ideas that I, uh, that I discussed uh, being addressed further. So thank you for now. Thank you very much, Inge, for, for your presentation. And also thank you for introducing in particular the concept of horizontal approaches versus uh, sectoral approaches because that's actually an excellent also segue uh, for our next um, presenter, uh, who is Ms. Uh, Viviana Venegas, um, who is the director of the Directorate of Economy and Digital Development of the um, DNP. 
And um, Viviana will introduce um, the Colombia's data strategy, which is exactly um, uh, one such horizontal approach to, to data governance. So Viviana, the floor is yours. And uh, thank you also to you for, for being with us. Muchas gracias, Christian. Muy buenos días para todos. Thank you, Christian. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to share this panel with Pablo Alejandro, with Professor Inge, uh, also to say hi to Audrey in this panel. We have heard the words of the general director of the National Planning Department. We have done a great deal of efforts to contribute to data portability. In my presentation today, the focus will be placed on a governance model that we're working on led by IDAPRE, which is the administrative department of the presidency of the Republic with the support of the TI ministry and the national department of planning. So what we would like to do is to show you the importance of working on a data infrastructure national plan one component being governance. And how are we going to improve competition? As Paulo has said it, and Christian, competition is key. And Diana is going to help us with the sharing of the presentation. Okay, we are getting ready. Thank you. Okay, while we wait for the screen, let me tell you about the background. At the National Planning Department, we have made a great deal of efforts to understand data portability. We have the Innovation Office which has encouraged a study on the consumer protection and free competition using non-financial digital platforms. What have we found? Some challenges related to the use of data. Understood as a market and good practices, of course, to address challenges. So all the practices uh, lead to the construction of data strategies and a general governance frameworks. There are a good of good things in free competition. We know that. We know that the consumer plays a key role in the digital uh, economy. Now, from our office, we have a multi-sectorial view. We have specialized in our sector, but we also have a cross-cutting vision of all the other sectors. So we have been there supporting the implementation of policies to promote the use of data to create social and economic value. So this is what we have done. This is to show you the policy background, just to indicate that we are contributing to this chain value and that it is important to be aligned in purpose. That's why these fora are so important because here is where we discuss and share ideas, challenges and progress. So in the past four years, we have prepared a public policy framework to increase the use of data in Colombia. Also, to address key issues so as to increase the availability of our quality data, increase the development of human talent, strengthen enablers to facilitate data sharing. And at the end of the day, something very important to improve, to increase data culture in our country. It's a key topic. So we have on the one hand, the National Development Plan, for the transformation, digital transformation in Colombia, we're going to implement a data infrastructure. Also, after this plan, we have COMPASS 3920, which is for data exploitation. Here we define conditions for the development of the data infrastructure in the country. And then COMPASS 3975, another policy. This is for digital transformation and artificial intelligence. 
This includes initiatives to create a data infrastructure, but with emphasis on the implementation of guidelines for the exploitation of data in the public sector and also in the data market. This is just to bear in mind our approach. We have worked together with many agencies in the country, and we have called this infrastructure a sort of shared resources, which are dynamic and standardized, uh, which are offered by different stakeholders, and that with enables the provision and use of quality data. This is just to remind you that definition, so we can see where we are going with this plan that we have developed with the presidency and with the ministry. Well, this is another public policy for economic reactivation, COMPASS 4023. And we have a chapter created to strengthen the digital enablers in the data infrastructure. This will allow to play a key role in the generation of social and economic value through data. And we have defined this through five uh, lines of action, strategic actions, and then a number of sub-actions. One is to publish the Data Infrastructure National Plan and the roadmap, then to implement the Data Infrastructure National Plan. One thing is to design, one thing is to implement, of course. Another action, implementation of the governance model, which is led by DAPRE, together with the Ministry of the, with the support of the Ministry. And another one is to use opportunities for technical cooperation. Many multilateral agencies have provided support to us in this endeavor. Okay, now you have a context. Now, why this need for a data infrastructure in the country? I like to refer to an essential component, which is part of this proposal of uh, conceiving data as infrastructure, an infrastructure of data. Uh, there's a change a need for change here. We have to change our mentality. We have to see data as an infrastructure because then data use will be homologous. Uh, for instance, the infrastructure for the and for telecommunications should be common. And this has to do with the development process for all data, whereby we recognize the social and economic power from the use and reuse of data. And also, we know that data have acquired already a value, which is to be capitalized on in the whole economy. And there are some principles to be met, uh, such as availability, security, and, and standardization to generate trust in the use of data. A lot has been done in competition, in regulations, and I think it is important to also have reliance and trust in the use of data. And last but not least, the potential value, economic and social of data. Data are to be perceived because of that as a infrastructure and they have to be managed through governance models, interoperability models and sustainability models as well. Well, as to the national data infrastructure plan, we have three sections nationwide. First section, the context where the description of data takes place. We have to define the conceptual basis for the plan and also the role of data and its strengthening. This is done through a definition of some principles and purposes, which are the uh, uh, directing principles for our work. Another action or section is to set the framework for understanding of the plan. The different components that make part of the data infrastructure, for instance, the strategy and governance data, the use of data, interoperability, security and privacy of data, technical and technological tools, etc., among many other things. And last but not least, we have the roadmap. 
we are gathering actions for the development or implementation of each of the components of the plan. We have already 33 actions defined and the joint participation of 10 entities, BAPRE, DANE, etc., many agencies, almost all the key agencies that are related to data. Now, the governance model for the data infrastructure. On the one hand, we have development of the governance model. This is one of the first actions in the plan. What we seek is to set up the foundations to define uh, who, are, who is responsible, the rules of the game, standards, process, and principles. And of course, this has to do with the whole world of data. The cycle, the life cycle of data should provide a benefit from their use. And the model of governance is also a bridge uh, to bridge with all the policies uh, that operate in the country on data. The model seeks to incorporate the principles of openness, integrity, ethics, and innovation to benefit all the ones involved, all the stakeholders. And the definition of governance allows to set the principles so that the data owners we have a decent degree of participation in the use of information and also of data who are in under the name because here we have transparency reliability issues involved and to close I have this message how to address data portability from our PNID the uh, Data Infrastructure National Plan. So we have five fronts, five major fronts that we have identified and that are related to data portability. There is a straight direct relationship because these are enables, enablers for data portability to progress. So we have principles of general application to ensure the use of data by all the users and that the requirements of platforms are met. And these principles should allow for a flow of data and information. Another element is interoperability. It's an enabler of the sharing of information by agencies and entities. This open up opportunity spaces for cross-border data, for sharing of data, I mean, among many other things. A third front is the regulatory review for data sharing and portability. We have to review and analyze all the enablers that we have in the legal Colombian framework. We have done a lot in this field and we have to start uh, coordinating our efforts from public policy. Another element which is important in any scenario we talk about is citizens' participation. We have to strengthen the trust of users in data. And also we have to encourage citizens' empowerment. What to do with the data? How are they treated? They have to participate in those decisions. So this is a key element. And last but not least, governance. What about governments? Governance will coordinate the other four elements. Governance will ensure mechanisms for consultation and effective participation of all the stakeholders in the digital economy. We have to use not only public data, but also private sector data, individuals' data, etc. We know that there are many categories of data. So we need governance frameworks, and they have to be democratic. They have to be transparent. They have to encourage uh, that all the stakeholders that make part of the data ecosystem make decisions on the use of their data and know the consequences thereof. Well, this is all. I, this is what I wanted to share. And just to illustrate what we're doing in our uh, department, and particularly on the model of governance, that we're developing together with the ministry and the presidency of the Republic. Thank you very much, Kristen, for giving me the floor. Thank you very much uh, to you, uh, Viviana, for your presentation, and um, which was very fascinating for, for multiple reasons. I mean, one, one reason, if I may, and a lot of the audience may not be aware of, but that 
Um, actually, the OECD is uh, starting to work on national data strategies. And so we will definitely have a look at also uh, what you just prevent, presented in more detail as we uh, do our assessment of countries national strategy. And the second point that I wanted to highlight is um, what I also find very interesting is the concept of data as an infrastructure, which is indeed um, um, a, a concept that I, I, I know also a lot of people had some difficulties understanding when we introduced that in our 2015 report. Um, so for those of you who, who struggle also understanding the concept, I will recommend also reading this particular report. So let's move on uh, because uh, we, 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 we have received quite a number of questions. So uh, all the presentations so far have, has generated a lot of interest and a lot of questions. And I'm sure the next presentation uh, from uh, Mr. Alessandro Delgado will probably also generate additional comments and questions. So let's move to that. Uh, so uh, Alessandro is a lawyer from the uh, Universitas de los Andes and works as a consultant on data and artificial intelligence policies at the center of the fourth industrial Re revolution of Colombia. So uh, please, Alessandro, the floor is yours and we welcome and are interested to, to hear from your experience and also uh, a great thank you for being with us. Thank you for your invitation. Hi, everyone. I'm going to speak in, in Spanish, but in any case, thank you for the invitation. Um, un saludo a todos. Bueno, Greetings to everybody. As you have heard, and it has been said this morning, data portability is key, is very important. And together with interoperability, they are the two key aspects to create a database economy. And this economy, whatever this scenario, is reflected on many aspects, but also it has a lot of challenges that we have to address. And I'd like to tell you about the work that we have done in this sense. First, I'd like to stress the importance not only of uh, having a regulatory legal framework for governance and public policy, a strong one. Well, Colombia has been working a lot on this in BNDP and together with all the allies. But most important is what Christian said. It is impressive to see that in Latin America, a few countries have done work in this sense, in this huge endeavor to manage data from many points of view. Well, we are already on the right track following the best practices of uh, the OECD countries. And we should all have a holistic ma manner of managing data at regulatory level, public policy and governance. Well, at our center, we have uh, worked a lot in data already one year and a half. The results are shown in a document published in the December. Data for a common purpose, allowing the transition of Colombia in data management. In this document, in this report, we state the importance of data, the importance of uh, data governments, as Viviana said, but also, we also place emphasis on um, providing a drive, uh, which is the Moonshot project. This is a project on the sharing of data for um, common good. We have a new view to assess the value of data. We want to generate trust. The assessment of data is key to know the the true importance of data and how do you measure that value? How do you assess value, the, the value of data? This is an important part that you have to bear in mind from the very beginning. What is the true value of data? The impact, the economic impact, the social impact of data, the impact in each specific sector that is key the value of data and how you measure that. As uh, regards the project, it's been a great deal of work, joint work, joint effort with the World Economic Forum, 
with the Institute of Colombia, the Ministry of Commerce and INDIC, and the Mayor's Office of Medellin, and the Center for Innovation. And all together, we have analyzed the possible impact of the sharing of data in public spaces and sectors, particularly in the energy sector. We did a zoom on energy. Why? Because energy is key in the energy transition of Colombia. It's important for the country. And also because it requires a lot of data and a lot of data can be used to improve the transition. That's why we are uh, placing a lot of emphasis on the energy sector. And we will let you know about the results we find further on. Data sharing has uh, multiple purposes and challenges in general. First, they can be catalyzers to allow for the economic transition of a country. In our concrete case, we are analyzing how to improve through the sharing of data, the economic transition of Colombia, moving to a database economy. And the second place, it allows to tackle inequalities in society, low productivity, to tackle corruption, the big social problems and economic problems that we have in our countries. They can be tackled, they can be improved those problems through the right data management, the good use of management of data. And here again, we have another challenge, good use of data. What is the good use of data? How to prevent all the risks involved? Digital security, for instance, how to tackle digital security. In, um, in such a complex environment, digital security is always uh, there. It's always an issue. There's never zero uh, issue in this regard. That's why what Viviana said about the national plan, for instance, data infrastructure is so important because it will provide a framework to deal with the models that will enable the sharing of data. There can be a number of models. We're talking about the trust of data or data common goods, data as common goods or data markets, which are key, not only for data sharing locally, but in the framework of uh, free trade agreements or macro trade agreements uh, with Colombia and the Pacific. Those frameworks are important because if we manage to have those frameworks for data that will facilitate the use and that will improve a whole region, we can improve what happens in the whole region. Risks, well, as you have mentioned them, many, and what Inge said in her presentation about the portability risks, they're clear, they're truly clear, but we have to try to speed up our risk mitigation and minimization when dealing with the data portability. As to the assessment of data, when you speak of assessment of data, then you have to understand better the value of data and you have to understand how to develop a data-based economy and also to be able to send, sell better at political level the use of data by the government. By doing this, you can measure the value at social level, at the economic level, so that politicians and polit policymakers will understand the, the true power of data. The power of data is not only eco an economic power. I'd like to highlight this strong message. The power of data goes beyond that, beyond what you see at the economic level. And so that has to be measured also. All this has to be measured. The Moonshot project in particular has allowed us to identify opportunities to speed up the environmental liabilities management to deal the aspect of climate change. We have to try to contribute to solving climate change issues, in help improving um, and encouraging innovation in public and private institutions in an ethic and responsible manner. 
to use uh, key assets. That's why portability is so important. This is the framework of uh, data portability, which is essential for a good use of data. And also making progress in new models based on the responsible use of data. This is another idea. And here we have to be even more innovative, talking about models, because you, you might be innovative, but there will always be security innovation, what you can do legally and then innovation. There's always these two elements, these two aspects to consider. These dichotomies, so to speak, between what you can do and what you want to do. And there is data management and data use in very regulated environments. That's a big challenge that we have to deal with. And this challenge is also translated into fear or lack of trust. Oftentimes, lack of trust in data projects, not by the one who does the project, but by the final user or consumer. Oftentimes, final consumers do not trust data issues or topics, particularly in these times. Last year, remember when Apple decided to activate the possibility of having a pop-up if you downloaded an application or if you had a application ready to open, then there would be a pop-up giving you the immediate opportunity to the consumer to say, no, no, I don't want to share my data. Well, most people would say no and that has had a big impact on a number of business models in the Apple ecosystem. So this possibility for the consumer to say no automatically has changed the rules of the game. So we have to make a big effort in infrastructure and in education for the consumer to develop trust in the consumer as to the use of data. Also important is to balance competitive actions between data generation and innovation. We have seen this big dichotomy. Annie has, has already referred to the GDPR, which is so important. There are many regulatory frameworks that need review in order to find this balance, this compromise so that innovation may be related as something that involves trust and confidence. Now, as to the energy sector specifically, the Moonshot project reviews what is the true value of data in the energy sector, particularly in the Colombian energy sector. A number of assessments are required, risk assessments, based on the impact of data use. This will have a say in, in decision-making, of course, and in costs, in finding ways to improve revenues, in finding ways to improve productivity in Colombia, in the energy sector. One step has been assessing the value of our data in the sector, including the dimensions of value and the risks in the context considered in the energy sector. The main problem we have found is to define specifically a concrete use of data use in the energy sector. And then also a difficulty has been to get aligned with the definition established. There were many discussions in the project which focused on the management of the data rights, ownership of data. Ownership of data becomes a big challenge as well when you are analyzing data sharing in specific sectors, whatever sector you take. It becomes a huge challenge, this management of the data rights and portability of data is clearly enough 
in this something that requires doing that analysis. So as you can see, we have a big challenge ahead. The project is still ongoing, it's still alive. We are working on that this year. And what we want is to have Colombia and other Latin American countries uh, being committed to encourage their uh, economic transition to drive it. We want to generate trust, security for those transitions. Mm. We want people to trust the importance of data and use the data. And we want to get all the stakeholders involved and all the communities to better meet their needs and to better assess the importance of data and their portability. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Um, so we have, um, I would say, let's say 12 minutes uh, for, for question and answers. Um, and I would like to actually to pick your point, Alessandro, that you made at, towards um, the end of your presentation about the importance of trust um, and also the importance of uh, the issue of control over data and our data ownership. And as some of you know, um, at the OECD, we have been rather preferring talking about the concept of uh, control rather than the concept of ownership, because that's a much more complicated and often misunderstood concept. Um, but with that in mind, I would like to maybe point all, uh, to, to the question that um, uh, was also raised in the chat by uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Maria uh, Lorena Flores Roy Roy Royas. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, which essentially is touching on that issue uh, with a focus on the financial sector. But I would like to give, um, so I will open the floor to, to Pablo to address that specific question. But I would actually also like to maybe ask also Inge to address um, the, let maybe the broader question about how do we um, actually address the, the risks that comes with uh, the data, uh, data portability related to privacy and the potential loss of control maybe uh, because at the same time, we know that data portability is about giving individuals uh, control. Uh, so maybe I, I give uh, both of you the floor to answer uh, these questions, and then um, I will pick another question for the two other panelists. And there has been a question also addressed to me specifically, which I will also like to address. So uh, I will start with uh, Pablo. No doubt, our constitutional system establishes very precisely and very clearly a right of citizens to basically know particularly what information exists in the database so that with this right, the guarantee of rectification can be exercised. In the question posed by Maria Lorena as to how technically the user, holder, or consumer have control of their own data in the light of Law 1581, well, this is a little bit behind this. It's a constitutional guarantee. And as a constitutional guarantee, both under Law 1586 and 1581, different mechanisms have been implemented depending on the sector or industry, the financial sector, for instance, or if it cuts across all sectors. And this implementation is the is based on the exercise of a fundamental right, which for certain scenarios needs to go to the level of uh, uh, legal action for uh, rights, but it really allows and fosters and promotes a system to know the personal data that may exist of each one of us in a database. And here comes what Christian was saying. Are we discussing control or ownership here? There's no discussion around control. Our constitutional provisions are relatively clear as to who is the controlling party in the information that appears in the database and what rights uh, do users have in that respect. As to data ownership, 
there have been several developments also, not only from the superintendency of uh, industry and commerce, but also from other agencies. The ownership of personal data and the digital constructions belongs to the user and therefore the development of new systems and the implementation of new mechanisms, like for instance, applications to guarantee digital identity and to avoid uh, personal identity theft or impersonation are also based on data ownership, which in strict terms the user has. So the regime includes those two elements, and it is very interesting to see that the National Planning Department in its structure and data management infrastructure includes both perspectives. Thank you very much, um, Inga. Yeah, thank you. It's indeed a very good and, and interesting question that I think you can answer from two different perspectives, because one perspective is the control that you as an individual or as a consumer have when you invoke your right uh, to data portability versus a data controller. I think in that relationship, it's indeed important uh, that individuals understand um, what data they are uh, porting uh, and also understand possible risks. Um, the other perspective, I think that's also important to keep in mind that in many situations, data will be relational. So what is my personal data, uh, for instance, if you think of a social network profile, will also involve data that relates to my friends, my family. And if I want to port that data that is very much relational, then this might also affect uh, the rights of others that might not agree with me wanting to move my Facebook profile to another provider that maybe has uh, another uh, an, a different, different terms of conditions that they might not uh, agree with. So I think in that sense, uh, this um, second part is also important to keep in mind that the data that you port uh, should also uh, be ported in a way that creates as little risks as possible for third parties that are not directly involved in that transfer, but that uh, whose data also is somehow related to the data that uh, involves you. Uh, so this indeed requires balancing and also um, I think there is a responsibility for the providers that are involved in that data transfer to make sure that only the data is ported that is really needed, for instance, if I want to use a particular new service. So that idea of balancing and thinking in advance of what data should be included in the transfer, I think that is very important to ensure the control of you as the individual porting your data, but also other individuals that are inevitably also involved. Thank you very much, uh, Inga. So I have another question, which um, I would like uh, Viviana to address, which is um, if she could, if you could please um, highlight what is the role really of the advantage that you see of national data strategies and data governance framework to develop data portability um, in, in economies. And if you could also address uh, the question that was raised um, about multi-stakeholder participation. I know in your presentation, you mentioned um, stakeholder involvement, but if you could also highlight this point to, to address the, the, the question that was addressed uh, from one of the, the participants, I think it was uh, again Maria who, uh, who raised that question. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, uh, to all the panelists. Thank you, and to all the participants in this panel. I will refer to that in two ways. The first is that the design of the governance model is part of the data infrastructure project, and it takes into account the participation of citizens, civil society, the experts in general, through the development of technical meetings, looking at the scope and approach for taking advantage of the life cycle of the data. These uh, groups or work groups are spaces for interaction and contribution in order to strengthen this model, which in the end will benefit the cooperation around the use of data. And I want to make a parenthesis here. The National Infrastructure Data Plan was published last year on the ICT ministry page from September 1 to 17th officially. However, it was basically published uh, throughout the whole month. Several comments were received regarding this plan and specifically regarding the governance model the presidency of the republic 
which is leading this project, will soon be publishing it. And we will also be making comments on spaces for socialization. So it's for you to bear this in mind. Now, regarding the importance of these strategies or initiatives at a national level that a country may have regarding governance frameworks, we can say that digital development and the increase in the effective exchange of data has important benefits for the development of all economies. So not only have we heard here about those benefits, but we also know that challenges come with them and all panelists have mentioned them. So specific in, specifically talking about my intervention, I think that data governance frameworks define, and I want to reiterate the word define, roles, responsibilities, and obligations involving all actors related in the value chain of the data. And this is important for the interaction between the providers and the receivers of data, because at the end of the day, this will allow uh, the possibility for a framework of trust, which is what Alejandro referred to. Additionally, uh, additional to this definition and the framework, this facilitates articulating data policies between the different countries and regions. Regionally, it is important because later on, it is important to have those exchanges with different regions worldwide. And at last, I would like to just mention that it is essential to work on governance frameworks that are clear and that will also foster or give incentive to the benefits of data exchange, because we know that because of the uh, challenges or lack of trust that may come with it or with this, we have sought that through this national plan and through the governance model, we'll be able to tackle issues that on the one hand will allow us to strengthen those uh, capacities and uh, knowledge of people regarding possibilities and risks. I think that we have to be self-critic here. We have to look at benefits, but also uh, aspects regarding access and exchange of data. Another important aspect is to promote or make it possible to develop technological infrastructure sustainable infrastructure that will favor the standardization of all the processes and the risk management in digital security throughout the whole life cycle of data. And the third element is to enable consultation mechanisms and citizen participation mechanisms that will enable a dialogue regarding the concerns and incentives in the different actors in the data ecosystem. And uh, looking at the last part, Chris, that you mentioned, these spaces favor the possibility to analyze all barriers from an interinstitutional approach, an intersectoral approach. And this is the way in which we have been tackling this in the country. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you very much. So I have a last question uh, for you, Alessandro, uh, which actually relates to um, a little bit the first question that uh, uh, Mark Rottenberg actually addressed to me, but I will address that to you, but I will answer to that. Uh, as well. Um, and this regards the, the relationship between larger firms and let's say smaller firms, um, because very often one of the concerns that has been raised in respect to data portability, and this is a little bit also the point that Mark is referring in his comment, which I will address um, as well, is that um, larger firms can basically take more advantage of data portability than smaller firms. And as you were talking about trust and the importance of control, I was uh, I wanted to know uh, from your experience, uh, what do you see as ways to basically address this particular concern that you will hear or you may have also hear from some of the uh, startups in, in Colombia? So if you could share with us your, your, your take on that one. Sí, gracias. Hemos hablado de lo que... We have spoken about data security, importance of having data governance, but we're missing something which is this data culture, data education, data appropriation. This point is essential, especially for the SMEs. Data culture, that has to be promoted. It doesn't exist yet. There's a long way to go on this. And this is directly related to trust in the data. To generate trust, we need to educate people what they are, what are they there for, and why do they work for them, especially for them? What are the big benefits in there for them? Without that, they will never 
do anything in respect to data and they will not be interested because they don't appreciate their value. We have to show them the value, the real value that data have for them, not in general, but more specifically, we have to make a big effort. And it's not a unique effort only for the SMEs. I'm talking about segmented efforts according to the sector, because each sector or industry is different. Each SME is different. Each industry or industries do not think the same. They're all very different. They all have their own sets of problems. And well, we know this, but they don't. They see data the other way around. The micro segmentation that we can handle with the data, well, the benefits are much larger for them, much more than the specific solution of the problems that may arise. This is what we have to show the SMEs, not only in our country, but worldwide, the importance of data, especially or particularly segmented. Thank you very much for your excellent answer, Alessandro. And um, if I may then uh, conclude with by answering uh, the first question that was actually addressed uh, to me, which is which was essentially why does the OECD in its definition of data portability does include um, not only natural person but also um, juristic persons? And the reason why we actually are legal person, sorry, the reason why we did that was essentially because we recognized that um, in certain constellation, in particular, if you are thinking in the competition context, you may have, in particular, smaller firms having X, having data generated, for instance, and when they are using certain um, machineries that then is controlled by a larger entity that may have also market dominance. And in those cases, one potential remedy to address that particular concern may be to give the, the business, so in this case, it wouldn't be a natural person, but a legal person, the right to data portability, so the right to access data that concerns the business um, uh, so that it can actually reuse this uh, and maybe exchange that with a potential competitor. So the concern that Mr. Uh, Rottenberg actually raised, um, in our view, does not fully apply here, but it's true nevertheless that there are competition concerns. And therefore, there, thank you very much, Alessandro, for raising this because I fully agree with you that, that um, one way to address that concern is basically to promote a data culture awareness and also skills development and competences. So with that, um, I would like to thank uh, all of you for your excellent contributions. Um, so unfortunately, the, um, I can't invite the panelists to, to, to applaud, uh, to, but um, we'll, we'll give now the floor to the second um, um, panel um, after a break. So thank you again, everyone for joining us and uh, see you hopefully in person soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Um, my name is Tyne Burden, and I'm a project manager with the OECD's Consumer Policy Unit. And it's my delight today to introduce our second panel uh, for today's workshop, which will be on best practices for empowering uh, consumers on online marketplaces. Now, today, a significant and growing number of consumers engage in e-commerce through online marketplaces, which are um, matching buyers and third-party sellers. They're attracted by benefits such as uh, convenient search and payment mechanisms and a broad product and seller choice. However, the existence of problems such as misleading claims, scams, as well as uh, counterfeit and unsafe products present uh, risks that may undermine consumer trusts, not only in online marketplaces, but in e-commerce uh, more broadly. Online marketplace businesses play a, a very important role in protecting consumers from such harms. And a central part of this role is providing uh, clear and relevant information um, to uh, consumers at the right time. And given the variety of approaches taken by different online marketplaces, it is important that the best practices to ensure consumer uh, empowerment on online marketplaces are identified. With this in mind, our experts today, which include policymakers, regulators, business representatives, as well as consumer advocates, will share their perspectives on the following key questions. How can online marketplaces best educate consumers uh, about common consumer risks and their rights? And how can online marketplaces, how can, pardon, how, what information should consumers have available to them on online marketplaces? And how can marks of trust used by online marketplaces, such as ratings and reviews, as well as public commitment, commitments, such as um, product safety pledges, assist consumers to make more empowered purchasing decisions. I'd now, now like to invite uh, Hugh Stevenson, who is chair of the OECD's Committee on Consumer Policy, uh, to take the floor to share some of the OECD's work in this area. Hugh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Time. Muchas gracias. Buenos días a todos. Uh, me llamo Hugh Stevenson, presidente actualmente del Comité de la Política del Consumo de la OCDE. Y uh, voy a pronunciar mi discurso en inglés, pero de antemano, bueno, solo quería decir que agradezco muchísimo esta oportunidad de abordar temas tan importantes para los consumidores en América Latina, de hecho, en el mundo entero. Y también, Uh, en particular, debo reconocer el gran apoyo de la Superintendencia de Industria y Comercio uh, de Colombia y del Superintendente Barreto para el trabajo de la OCDE sobre la protección al consumidor y la política del consumo. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. It is a, a pleasure to uh, be here today to present uh, the work by the OECD Committee on Consumer Policy Uh, which has been addressing consumer issues for 50 years and has recently addressed today's topic, consumer protection in online marketplaces. And I hope this presentation sets the scene for the distinguished uh, expert panel discussion uh, to follow. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, online marketplaces are now, uh, as I think we all know as consumers, key e-commerce channels globally, and they can enhance trust. Uh, they can offer consumers a range of benefits Uh, including broad product and seller choice, uh, reviews and rating systems, and in many cases, integrate, uh, integrated payment mechanisms and, and convenient shipping options. Uh, despite their popularity, though, they often present challenges that have captured the attention of many consumer authorities. Uh, and the issues include uh, misleading uh, conduct by third-party sellers, fake ratings and reviews, scams, uh, counterfeit and unsafe products. And policymakers are addressing these consumer protection problems to ensure that consumers can continue to enjoy the full benefits of online commerce. And one tool that can help both policymakers and online marketplaces is the development and use of best practices that marketplaces can use to address the risks uh, that are posed to consumers. The uh, next slide, please. The OECD's Committee on Consumer Policy has been examining the role of online marketplaces in enhancing consumer protection and, and consumer trust uh, for several years now. And that work includes a going digital policy note, uh, which you see here to the right on the screen. It also includes an expert panel discussion at our international consumer conference, which was held last June, which attracted 
over a thousand uh, attendees from a hundred jurisdictions. And the panel proceedings and the related materials such as the infographics, the art sketch you just saw are available to you online. Next slide. In 2021, the uh, OECD committee also circulated uh, two questionnaires uh, to online marketplace businesses and to OECD member and partner country governments. And uh, the goals of these questionnaires were to better understand the issues affecting consumers on online uh, marketplaces and to identify the marketplace best practices and to ask how can governments and online marketplaces work better together. And these questionnaires sought information on uh, common consumer complaints, how marketplaces respond to those complaints and to reports from authorities. They sought information on cooperation between government authorities and online marketplaces. They sought information on online marketplaces' own initiatives to enhance consumer protection beyond their legal obligations. And it sought information on consumer initiatives in this area, uh, government, excuse me, initiatives in this area. And in the end, 28 countries responded to the questionnaire including seven in Latin America, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Peru. Uh, we also had uh, 15 large online marketplace businesses respond to the questionnaire, uh, including Mercado Libre and others that are active in the region. Uh, we'll soon publish a report on the results, but today let me offer a, a preliminary view of the top four general issues that the questionnaire responses highlighted. First, the responses from governments and marketplaces indicate that fraud and scams are indeed uh, common concerns. Uh, at the same time, a key issue highlighted by the, the country questionnaire responses is the lack of directly comparable data on consumer complaints relating to online marketplaces. The complaint systems generally don't flag consumer complaints depending on whether they arose or not in an online uh, marketplace. Second, while there is cooperation between governments and online marketplaces, there's also room for improvement. And a key challenge that countries noted was having marketplaces promptly take proactive measures that were available, such as removing non-compliant product listings, and sharing third-party seller contact details. On the other hand, uh, some marketplaces noted a lack of coordination between different government authorities with consumer protection responsibilities, the marketplaces also had concerns about potential enforcement gaps for scams and online fraud and had concerns about the need for government authorities uh, to include all relevant information and product safety reports so that marketplaces could act on them more quickly. A third um, uh, issue that was raised generally is that some online marketplaces are indeed going beyond their legal obligations to protect consumers. Uh, that includes developing dedicated portals for authorities to report listings for unsafe products, mediating disputes between third-party sellers and consumers, and providing compensation when, for example, sellers don't honor returns policies. Uh, at the same time, the responses indicated that more could be done to support marketplaces. So few marketplaces reported using relevant external consumer protection resources, such as those developed by governments or international organizations. And this suggests that such resources, as think for example of the OECD Global Recalls Portal for product safety, could be better promoted. And the fourth theme was requiring more information from third-party sellers when listing products is beneficial. At the same time, there may be some limits to this. More information about third-party seller identity and about the compliance of certain high-risk products with product safety regulations helps in policing the market. Uh, indeed, the importance of providing basic information about businesses engaged in e-commerce is a theme of the OECD's uh, consumer e-commerce guidelines, <clears throat> uh, which, uh, by the way, are available in Spanish thanks to uh, the uh, Mexico and US uh, consumer authorities. On the other hand, uh, marketplaces have raised concerns that additional information requirements may be difficult where marketplaces don't take physical possession, for example, of goods, uh, raising questions of how to verify compliance or where they specialize in secondhand or handmade goods where it may be difficult to apply uh, standard product identifiers. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, we're also doing work to address product safety issues in online marketplaces, and product safety was a key consumer protection concern identified in the, in the questionnaire responses. Uh, in June of 2021, the OECD committee, which has a working party on consumer product safety specifically, also released a communique calling on governments to develop more product safety pledges with online marketplaces. And these are public documents in which online marketplaces commit to take steps to enhance uh, product safety beyond their legal obligations. Australia, the European Union, and uh, South Korea each uh, have already developed their own product safety pledges with major online marketplaces in their jurisdictions. And this OECD communique uh, identifies the key commitments that should be included in any new pledges as, as noted in the slide. Uh, here the, to benefit marketplaces and consumers alike. The working party is currently developing a policy guidance to help implement this communique with practical examples of what marketplaces can do drawn from the country and government questionnaire responses, such as using digital tools to detect and remove unsafe product listings, uh, regularly consulting the OECD global recalls portal to identify newly recalled products and the like. Uh, next slide. Uh, that I think is all there is time to describe for you today, other than to say there, there are other OECD work products that are relevant today's, to today's topic that you can find at the link in this uh, last uh, slide, such as a survey that was conducted on consumer experiences in, um, I think it was 12 countries uh, with peer platform or collaborative economy marketplaces, there was work on ratings and reviews and the OECD guidelines I mentioned on consumer protection in e-commerce. Uh, with that, I look forward to hearing the experts' presentations on how consumers can be better protected in online marketplaces. Many thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me uh, uh, through the secretariat or the conference organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugh, for that overview of our work. Um, moving now closer to home for a lot of the audience, uh, I'd like to introduce our distinguished uh, panel of experts from Colombia and from the region. Uh, so I'd like to invite uh, my panel to please uh, put on your cameras. Uh, each panelist will present on their own organization's work, uh, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So please, I do encourage you, uh, the audience, to um, place your questions for the panel uh, into the chat and hopefully we'll have a chance to get to all of them. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker to the panel, which is Colombia's Deputy Superintendent for Consumer Protection, Juan Camilo Duran. Deputy uh, Superintendent Duran is a trained lawyer and holds master's degrees in law from both the Universidad Averiana uh, in Colombia and the London School of Economics. And prior to joining the SIC, he practiced at several law firms and also was a company director. So Deputy Superintendent, thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to now give you the floor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, gracias. Thank you to OECD for your invitation and the organizers. And we are very thankful to participate in this international forum to talk about consumer protection, which is such an important topic as the e-commerce. Uh, in Colombia uh, and globally, we have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that and the growth of uh, the use of uh, uh, online shops has been increasing exponentially. And that's why we play a key role in our role as an entity that is there to protect consumers in Colombia. Are you listening? Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you very much for that um, statement, uh, Deputy Superintendent. Um, appreciate that. And I have a few questions for you uh, as well, which uh, I'll get to at the end uh, during the Q&A. 
Um, so with that, I, I would like to just in introduce our next um, panelist who will also give a, a short presentation. Um, so if I could please uh, ask uh, Rafael Aguere to please uh, put on your, your camera now, Rafael. Um, Rafael is the head of uh, multilateral affairs at Mexico's Federal Consumer Protection Agency or Profeco. Uh, Rafael is responsible for representing uh, Profeco in international consumer protection and liaising with other domestic government agencies on matters of consumer protection. He holds a Bachelor of Psychology from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and has prior experience in coordinating international social development programs at um, local state and federal level. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome Rafael. Thank you, Thaim. Code of Ethics for e-commerce and the Profeco's Digital Trustmark, which are two programs that are of recent inception that address the issues that we have found uh, related to e-commerce. One of the areas for Profeco that's of interest for us is e-commerce. E-commerce has grown in Mexico exponentially since the, since the late 2000s, and this growth has uh, been uh, significant due to the COVID crisis. Uh, our latest statistics tell us that from 2019 to 2020, e-commerce has grown from 19% to 24%. So it was very significant due to COVID restrictions. So it, it is important for Profeco to address the issues related to consumer protection uh, when we face uh, e-commerce challenges. Uh, first of all, I would like to comment briefly on our regulatory framework. We have, uh, regarding specifically to e-commerce, we have two, uh, two dispositions, one mandatory and one uh, is a reference disposition, which is first, the first one is the Federal Consumer Protection Law, Article 76 bis, which states the mandatory requirements for suppliers that engage in e-commerce. Just very briefly, this, this require, these mandatory requirements are Consumer information must be not be shared by suppliers if they do not have the consent of the consumers. E-commerce transactions must be safe and confidential. There must be mechanisms to guarantee that. Suppliers must provide minimal contact information. That is uh, their address, physical address. That is uh, an email, a telephone number. That is minimal for suppliers to give in e-commerce. Deceptive practices in information and advertisements should be avoided. Pricing and terms and conditions uh, for before the transaction must be transparent. A spam should be avoided. Uh, that is not solicited uh, communications from suppliers. Product specifications should be supplied to the consumer uh, before the transaction. And the information in advertising should be the information and advertising in e-commerce should be clear and uh, non, not deceiving, and it should uh, play uh, special attention to vulnerable consumers such as children and the other. So th that is one of the articles that's related to specifically to e-commerce. The second article would be 76 bis, one which states that our Ministry of Economy can issue a mandatory, well, not can issue a e-commerce standard which is the legal basis for the e-commerce standard that we have. It is a, not a mandatory standard. It is a reference standard, NMX COA 001 SCFI 2018. It was published in 2018 and it develops on the previous mentioned princip mandatory principles. They're developed in, the, in, in this standard. And I just would like to comment quickly that they're based on the OECD's uh, e-commerce recommendation that uh, Hugh mentioned, and also on the ISO 10008, 2013, the quality management and customers, customer satisfaction in e-commerce, which is one of the two uh, standards, e-commerce standards that, that ISO has. Uh, a, note, a brief note on the definitions that are, are uh, stated on the standard, which are the supplier, we have a definition for supplier, which is 
consistent with the consumer protection law. Intermediate supplier, which is a person, physical or moral person that handles a digital platform that we define also as uh, information system that is defined in the code of commerce. And the third supplier, the supplier that has a contract with the platform to, to engage in commerce with uh, consumers. So just to talk about the code of ethics in e-commerce and the Profacos Digital Trust Mark, there are two programs that were developed in the last two years. They go hand in hand. And because for a supplier to have the digital trust mark, uh, they must adhere to the code of ethics uh, that is, uh, that is uh, and, and it's included on the part of the prerequisites for suppliers to include the digital trust mark in the web page. The code of ethics is a set of voluntary standards for suppliers in e-commerce. Uh, I have to highlight also that the two programs are voluntary. So the, there are no, but once the, the supplier uh, has make, made a commitment in both programs, they have to adhere by the, the, the prerequisites of the commerce standards, the prerequisites of the digital trust mark and all, all the mandatory e-commerce uh, uh, legislation. So the code of ethics is a set of voluntary standards for suppliers in e-commerce that, uh, that whose objective is to respect and promote consumer rights, promote responsible consumption, promote consumer human rights, promote responsible and ethical digital advertising, protect vulnerable groups, and promote self-regulation. It was published in our official federal journal on February 2021. So it also has definitions for platforms and, and suppliers. It defines an e-commerce platform as a tool for e-commerce. And it defines a virtual store as a website that sells products. So we have the two distinctions between a, a platform and, a, and retail for, for suppliers in e-commerce. Uh, the registration process is pretty straightforward. Uh, the supplier uh, goes to the web page. I, I'll share the link and after the presentation uh, to all attendees and panelists. Uh, the, the supplier submits a registration request analyzed by Profeco to see if there are any missing prerequisites. If all observations by Profeco that the, the supplier is compliant, the registration is granted, and then the the supplier can display the digital trust mark for uh, the, their website or, or platform. So the digital trust mark, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of for suppliers in e-commerce in order for them to stand out for commitment to transparency, safety and confidentiality in the treatment of data of consumers. The, the prerequisites are uh, adhering to the e-commerce uh, standard, they have to fulfill a request format, accept the terms and uh, of the digital trust mark, accredit their per legal personhood. So they, they, they are compliant not only in consumer protection, but before our tax out our treasury ministry. Our, uh, the, there's also a registration before the economy ministry and the tourism ministry, if apl applicable. They do they do they mustn't have any fines outstanding with Profeco. They have to be compliant with other programs that we have, such as a, a, a conciliation, which is one of the main tools uh, previously for Profeco, and uh, the registration of the e-commerce form. And also, as a minimal prerequisite, it would be the HTTPS certificate for the website. So that's that's a minimum requirement for for the digital trust mark. So just to briefly sum up this, the e-commerce the e is a an ongoing concern and we, uh, we believe that there's alignment between the objectives of industry and, uh, and enforcement. So, so due to the growth of the e-commerce uh, in Mexico, so uh, we're looking forward to working hand in hand with, uh, with compliant suppliers in, in e-commerce and, and addressing all the issues that that present themselves due to the growth of, of e-commerce. That would be all from, from our side. Thank you, Thayne.
Thanks so much, Raphael. It's, it's really interesting for us to hear about the, the digital trust mark. I think that it sounds like a really um, groundbreaking initiative from Mexico. And I think I have a question about that uh, later on. Um, but I'd like to now introduce our next uh, panelist, who is Antonino Serra Cambasares. Antonino, if you could uh, please uh, switch on your camera. Uh, Antonino is an advocacy manager for Consumers International. Uh, he's a lawyer working in the area of consumer protection since 1990. He's worked on a range of Consumers International um, projects, including e-commerce, product safety, and law development, including notably uh, the development of CI's uh, Latin American model law for consumer protection. He's also a professor of consumer law and telecommunications law at a number of uh, universities in Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and Peru, amongst others. Antonino, welcome. You now have the floor. Thank you, Thyme. And uh, we'll start in English and thanking you and Colombia, the Superintendencia de Industria y Comercio de Colombia, for this invitation for Consumers International to participate in this very relevant and very interesting um, event and session. I, I have some, uh, some slides, so I will share them with you now. Can you see them? Right. Yes, perfect. Perfect. So um, the idea today is to um, talk a bit on best practices on empowering consumers on online marketplaces, but also what is the view and the work of consumers international and consumers international members on, on, on these aspects. So the first thing I want to, 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 to say, and I'm turning into uh, Spanish now, um, is what is regarding consumer protection. One of those uh, concerns is the consumer's trust in digital economy, because it's an issue that arises when we ask our members in all countries around the world, which are your priorities and your type of work? That's what they say. Also, the issues regarding with sustainable consumption, climate change, especially in terms of reliable, consistent information regarding these topics, sustainability, climate change. Then also in general terms, the fairness, let's say, and the transparency in the markets. How can markets be enhanced? How can they be more transparent and more equitable? And all this because for us, as an organization, it is very important to work offering ideas, proposals to be developed in each individual country and also internationally to have policies that look at the consumer, that are based on the consumer. Regarding online markets uh, or marketplaces more particularly, perhaps the main question that we ask ourselves is how can consumers trust online transactions through digital media? This is an issue that is not only relevant, but also very uh, of uh, our times today, taking into account that digital transactions are becoming, if they have not already in many countries, are becoming the default, uh, the new normalcy, the new thing used by everybody. And as we all know, in digital transactions, or one of the most important components of digital transactions is the component of being cross-border or their ability to be cross-border. And this, presents different challenges to those that exist when we talk about domestic markets. So we want to have effective tools for consumer protection. 
and for consumers to eventually obtain compensations should there be any problems with the transactions that they carry out. There's a lot of topics, some of them already mentioned in the previous panel, that are related with the digital economy, with digital markets, with the digital economy. And I would like to concentrate on one on which Consumers International has been working lately, which is the safety of the products sold. We found, actually we did some research in the last two years, and we found some numbers that are quite concerning. For instance, two thirds of the products that were tested from Euro consumers, which is one of our members, in a study that they did, they saw that they were unsafe and therefore illegal. This for the European market. Then in the OECD, in a study in 2016, found that 68% of the products had been banned or recalled and they could still be found for sale online on online sites. And also that 33 out of 60 products were available to be bought online and they did not comply with voluntary or mandatory product safety standards. In a survey that we did in 2019 uh, among our members, among 89 countries, the responses said that 40% of countries have no product safety agreement regarding product safety between national authorities in the different uh, countries and online marketplaces. And that less than 10% of the countries had agreements to ensure that online platforms would remove unsafe products once notified about it. And that only 12% of online platforms had a specific contact point with the authorities for the purposes of reporting on safe products. So talking about all this, we decided to take another step and we put together a number of guidelines for product safety sold online. So this set of guidelines we developed together with uh, online organizations, but we also had the participation and the input of different important actors. Also international organizations, the academia, the OECD also greatly contributed with us, especially the work group on product safety for consumers. So the idea is that we look for information and based on that, the idea was to present these guidelines as a way to help governments I'm sorry, I lost sound. I lost sound. You're back, Antonino, we can hear you. Hola, me escuchan ahora? Can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me now again? Yes. Yes, yes. So I was saying that the guidelines have five main areas, or they're divided into five main areas. The first one is a number of overarching principles, general principles that we consider should guide all the actions in relation to the security or safety of the products that are sold online. And this I'll be uh, mentioning in my next slide. Then we have another section that talks about what can governments do, recommendations for governments, as to how to encompass and tackle different topics and how to offer ideas as to what would be solutions for those problems regarding product safety in our view. Then we have the responsibilities of online marketplaces and platforms how to oversee the products that are sold in their platforms, 
how to enhance cooperation with the authorities, and also what type of responsibilities do they have vis-a-vis -vis consumers. Then, a section on how to handle complaints and compensations, how to redress that, and one last section that talks about how to enhance information and education of consumers so that they can acquire safe products or they can acquire products online safely. At last, some recommendations for actions. We start from a general principle, which is in the guidelines of the United Nations for Consumer Protection, which is the level of product safety and consumer protection that is to be used on online marketplaces should not be less than in other forms of commerce and that mechanisms should be in place to ensure that the products sold in or through online marketplaces will not harm consumer safety and health. And that those products have to comply with the safety regulations of the country and or region where the product is to be sold. That online marketplaces should have greater liability and responsibility for ensuring the safety of the products sold on their platforms and that regulators should apply or enforce these responsibilities. And finally, the idea is that the same standards, the same high standards must exist regarding product safety, product safety in all the countries where the platforms or online markets operate in. So this is a summary. I will put on the chat the link for the guidelines. They are in English also and in French as well. And I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity for this presentation. Thank you. Uh, the consumer advocates perspective, as always, it's a really important one that all policymakers should take into account. Um, another important uh, perspective, though, of course, is the business perspective. And we're delighted today to have along um, a representative from uh, Latin America's leading uh, online marketplace, Mercado Libre. I'd like to now invite um, Federico Dea. Uh, to the floor. Federico is Mercado Libre's head of Legal Central. He is an Argentinian lawyer with a master's degree in both law and economics. He leads Mercado Libre's central legal team, responsible for a variety of areas, including dispute resolution, intellectual property, and privacy. And previously, he was um, a legal counsel for Google in Latin America, and his practice for the last decade has focused on digital uh, rights, internet law, and online dispute resolution. Uh, Federico, Welcome, you have the floor. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for the, for the introduction and thank you very much for giving me the chance to be part of this panel to share ideas, views, opinions with authorities and also with Consumers International here represented by Antonina. And also thank you very much to the attendants. I just read in the comments that we have an attendant from Korea participating, which I think is fantastic. So thank you for organizing this. Let me switch into Spanish as the majority of the attendance of Spanish speakers, so then we can switch into English for the Q&A, if that's okay for you. Latin America was the region where we saw the highest acceleration of electronic commerce in 2020. In our case, 2020 was a year of forced growth as a result of the pandemic and the provisional closing of the circulation and presential commerce in most of the countries. Whilst 2021 was a year different from what we call the hyper growth uh, year based on an improved structure evolving all the time to cover a demand that was unprecedented. For you to have an idea of the dimension of the impact of the ecosystem that Mercado Libre generates today, today we're operating in 18 countries and we have 45 million searches per day, 30 sales per second. We process more than 10 million transactions per day. And in the last year, we have incorporated more than 10 million new users in our ecosystem per quarter. So 
sometimes digital businesses at a scale, we are tempted to naturalizing them. But processing 30 sales per second, it implies that every day, directly or indirectly, we're managing two and a half million packages. Where in the online world, working at scale may seem simple and ordinary. But in our case, we also have an offline operation behind all this, which is huge, with sellers dispatching products, with our centers of distribution, the packaging operations, the mails, and everything that helps us put together our logistics network in each country. Let me repeat this. We're talking about 2.5 million packages per day and actually there is no way to face such a challenge but besides thinking of solutions to keep users satisfied all the time it's the only way for the system to be sustainable and successful because given this volume of operations there will be problems and one minimum percentage of pain may come an unmanageable amount of problems since our origin we have a vision that has centered around the user and in general giving them a good experience from the beginning to the end wherever there's a problem we try to come with a solution according to our possibilities. Our numbers tell us today that we have approximately four legal claims per 100,000 satisfactory sales. And out of those four, two thirds were able to redress or conciliate through the processes that we have implemented throughout the region. A few months ago, we adhered to the uh, uh, tool uh, facility in Colombia and numbers show the uh, results. So we will continue looking for alternatives to use this channel to redress more and more complaints. Same thing with Profeco in Mexico. It's working very well and we're very happy with the uh, tools that Profeco offers ODI for early attention to complaints. Now, our focus is not to solve disputes, but to avoid disputes from appearing. And the disputes are the undesired effect of an unsatisfied purchase, a client consumer or, or consumer service that has not solved something, and a seller that uh, had a problem. We have that we have to remember that as the SIC, we are just the contact portals. We do not manufacture the problem, the product, we do not package them, we do not uh, label them, and we don't know how it was cared for until it was shipped. But we are at the orders of the ones that made the offer with all the tools so that they publish the product completely with more and more fields to give more and more information to those that look for products in Mercado Libre. If you could make a, a comparison of what Mercado Libre showed in the past, you'll see a great evolution as a result of bigger demand from the user that is increasingly wanted to have more and more information. In fact, it's an infraction to our terms and conditions not to publish clearly and completely and precisely and with transparency the products are offered in our site, but beyond anything having to do with responsibility or liability in legal terms and what the intermediary should do or not do, there's a continuous effort on our part to improve users' experience. In Colombia, for instance, we launched recently a multi-gate system where a user with a problem can contact us through the traditional way, which was email or the messaging channel of the platform. And now we have WhatsApp and a whole system of telephone calls where you contact an assistant that has that case assigned in order to look for problem solutions. This allows the system to have a much more customized attention that seeks to give uh, solutions to recurrent problems, as is uh, problems in customer service. Almost 70% of the Colombian users that use this new system said that it is a portal of very easy access and very easy use. And we have seen how the satisfaction has been increasing in 5% every month. We believe that this type of solutions added to the increasingly marked use of ODR tools that are offered through the authorities in the region lead to consumers having a good experience, even though we may be talking about a consumer that is not satisfied with a purchase. But a bad management in the purchase, that's where we want to focus. We want to improve that. We want to be more visible and more friendly in the traditional FAQs. We have relaunched in 2021, our system of know your client system in order to better detect 
and prevent fraudulent profiles. And in the last few months, we have been launching in our protection program an anti piracy partnership with 10 top world brands to continue fighting against the uh, marketing of false or bogus products. These are all initiatives to better take care of our users. Now, taking advantage of this multi-sectoral panel, I would like to focus on the fact that the success of e-commerce as a system in itself does not rely on just one step or how good or bad it is done by one single actor in the system. It really relies, as Antonini said, to getting this system to be reliable. The term trust, reliance is key because without trust, this is just a house of cards that could uh, tumble down very easily. Building trust takes years and just seconds to destroy. So we really embrace all the initiatives that have uh, come up in the last year and that have, a, have come hand in hand with different authorities, publishing different guidelines or codes of good practices, as, as it's been the case of Chile or the case of the SIC in Colombia, the superintendency or the uh, CNSP in Brazil in order to combat piracy or the guidelines pro published by Consumers International hand in hand with Antonina, with whom we may have healthy differences, but it's good that this type of publications come to raise the bar, to raise the standard. Each one, of course, will have its own local flavor, but uh, the idea is to create a safe, reliable space for users without losing sight of innovation. And sometimes we have this need for self-regulation on the part of the different actors that we are involved that are involved in e-commerce. An additional point that I would like to touch on along the same lines is the public-private interaction that was mentioned at the beginning of previous presentations. The experience tells us that when we hear ourselves, when we understand both the problems and the tensions that appear in looking for solutions, we come to places of understanding with the authorities. That dialogue breaks barriers, it saves a lot of legal discussions and generates bridges where the ecosystem itself and the user will benefit. My example is the collaboration agreements that we have signed with Mercado Libre for more than 10 years now. To date, we have almost 50 collaboration agreements that we have signed throughout the region with different authorities, ranging from multi-competency authorities, as is the case of SIC in Colombia, or in the copy of Peru, or phytosanitary authorities, as is the case of Argentina, or authorities looking at health issues and uh, mm, or criminal areas or competencies throughout the region. They have different scopes, these agreements, but they seek to generate very close links to maintain our side, on the one hand, free of products that are infracting any laws and free of fraudulent actors. So we generate channels that expedite the review of publications on the one hand and request for user data so that authorities can carry out their investigations smoothly. In 2021, we have eliminated more than 38,000 publications under these agreements of cooperation. And these detections on the part of the authorities that reported to us have allowed us to remove thousands of other publications based on our artificial intelligence systems. As shown by our report of transparency from 2021, more than 99% of the publications removed in Mercado Libre are detected by our AI systems, fed with reports from uh, uh, previous uh, denounces or agreements with the authorities or reports from the users themselves through the portals on the site itself. All these merges into a system that feeds itself that allows us to have a site which is as protected as possible for each consumer regarding the quality of the products. All these efforts look at making our site increasingly safer and more and more reliable. That's for sure. And in closing my presentation, I would like to simply mention that I applaud the survey shared by Hugh Stevenson at the beginning, where I share the conclusions and hopefully we'll be able to work on those findings with the authorities throughout the region, seeking a better ecosystem for all of us. Thank you very much for this time.
Thank you very much, Federico. That's a, a very interesting uh, presentation. Certainly a lot, a lot of initiatives uh, are going ahead at Mercado Libre. Uh, and it was wonderful that you were also a part of our recent questionnaire. So thank you for that. Um, I'd now like to um, return to Deputy uh, Superintendent um, Duran, who is going to give an overview um, of um, some recent guidelines that uh, Colombia has developed in relation to uh, online influencer marketing on um, uh, online marketplaces and, and explain a little bit about um, how that came about. Um, yeah. And he'll also give uh, an overview of some other recent uh, developments in relation to e-commerce regulation in Colombia. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, Deputy Superintendent back to the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chaim. Mm, yes, in fact, the first thing that we must say is that the SIC, the Superintendency of Industry and Commerce, as the authority for oversight and control, does not have the regulatory powers to modify certain aspects of great importance. What is true is that today, the conditions or else the consumption habits of us as consumers have radically changed across all countries and Colombia is no exception to that. In that sense, as in Colombia, we have a law from 2011. That law from 2011 touched on important topics of e-commerce and on non-traditional channels and distance uh, sales or remote sales, among other media, in order to be able to acquire goods, products, or services. And in that sense, the law that rules us today in Colombia, which is the one in 2000 or from 2011, looks at certain circumstances that for the SIC must be adapted without going beyond what we're allowed to. In this sense, the concept of the marketplace, which has been developed in different jurisdictions, even uh, in the OECD, is a concept that even in Colombia, we have not internalized in our regulations or in our legislation yet. And there have been many, many regulatory projects that have looked at these issue and hopefully very soon we'll be able to have new legislation about e-commerce. But still today in Colombia, we have law 1480 of 2011 that talks precisely about certain concepts, being the first one, the contact portal. In uh, section 53 of this law, it says that this portal, or we have the definition of the contact portal and some obligations for the contact uh, portals. It also brings definitions, for instance, provider, producer, and consumer. And it is with these tools that any organization, and in this case, the Superintendency of Industry and Commerce in protecting the consumer must try to locate them and look for the way to bring these new forms of interaction over, these new ways to reach the consumers, bring them over, adapt them, and try to continue protecting the consumers in these new scenarios. I had already said this before, the pandemic has brought with it endless developments, and one of them has been the explosion in terms of electronic consumption and the explosion in terms of use of new channels and mechanisms to access consumers and from consumers to access these goods and services. One of them is influencers, for instance, influencers through that advertising, if we can call it that, when you traditionally uh, watched television, you would understand that an ad on television was paid for, and that therefore we understood that, they were, that it was advertising, and therefore it was not necessary to announce or to specify that that advertising that you were seeing on TV was advertising. It was understood as such. Today, we have the different social media, the networks to which you can access. You access directly the profiles of these individuals that have high numbers of followers that usually have an influence on certain field because they're experts or because, well, they are influencers. But the truth is that these are new 
uh, figures for consumption or for announcing or advertising new products or services. And for this new form of advertising, let me repeat, in 2011, we were not looking at this uh, as, uh, as strong as it is 11 years later, this type of advertising. So the Superintendency of Industry and Commerce worked on this and practiced and published a guide of good practices in uh, advertising through influencers. So basically what the superintendency is seeking, and not only the superintendency, but all the consumer protection agencies around the world, is that precisely consumers will be indicated that there will be transparency where the influencers in this case will indicate that these advertising or announcement or ad that is being seen in different media are is paid for that there is uh, someone there behind this advertising and this is not a live occasional experience but that behind that there is an effect and there is an objective a commercial objective behind this advertising or publications in such a way that what we seek here as the superintendency in the uh, area or in the realm of the different agencies that protect the consumers is transparency. I think that the key term is transparency. And I want to join Federico in what he said. There must be trust in the commercial transactions, not only in e-commerce. We want to see trust in all the media that may be used to acquire these goods or, ser or services, especially in e-commerce, where this has become very strong and we must not only as operators or agencies for consumer protection look at this, but instead all of us be united looking for that transparency in these new mechanisms, in these new advertising systems, in these new systems to acquire goods and services in such a way that we can all understand clearly when we're talking about a preview or something that, in fact, as was being said before, it's a preview from someone that, in fact, or acquired that product, or if it is paid for advertising. And in that sense, in effect, there are big differences, clear differences. And at last, going back to e-commerce, the Superintendency of Industry and Commerce developed a guideline of good practices in email, in e-commerce. But it is important to uh, go back to the beginning. These guidelines for protecting the consumer in e-commerce must be nurtured or fed by the current Colombian legislation. We cannot put together a guideline that may go beyond what is established under our legislation. The patterns of behavior, the patterns of consumption have substantially changed in the last years. The Superintendency of Industry and Commerce, as well as the other consumer protection authorities around the world are experiencing the situation, are adjusting to the change. And what this guideline seeks is to provide some simple tips to the consumers and suppliers and manufacturers and traders regarding the obligations and the rights that each of the participants and agents in the different markets have in relation to e-commerce when a good or a service is going to be purchased or acquired because by doing so electronically I don't have any direct access to looking at the uh, article that I'm purchasing and that's why, according to what Antonino said, we need more information so that the individual that is acquiring that good may have precise information about what is being bought. Why? Precisely because of that. I don't have it in my hands. I cannot touch it. I cannot feel that product that I'm acquiring. And this distance in e-commerce must be filled with that transparency and with all that information when the time comes to have a transaction or making the decision of acquiring that good through any platform or e-commerce. 
medium. So these are the two guidelines that we developed uh, recently in relation to e-commerce. We will continue working hand in hand, uh, Federico already said this, with alternative uh, mechanisms of dispute settlement. We believe that this will facilitate, uh, there is a tool that we've developed at the SIC, and it's a tool that will allow us through non-transactional mechanisms, come to direct agreements between suppliers and manufacturers, importers of products and consumers. And we embrace the fact that a very high percentage of the requests that come to the SIC have a positive solution in that first initial contact, which is just accompanied by the superintendency of industry and commerce. This SIC tool is not actually in a role of authority of consumer protection, it's just facilitating a dialogue. We firmly believe in the dialogue. We believe that we can solve disputes and obtain a timely solution for consumers, a prompt solution and an efficient solution. Thank you so much, Deputy Superintendent. That's, those initiatives sound um, incredibly interesting and um, it was uh, really uh, wonderful to have that overview. Um, I think one of the things that resonated in your presentation and also all of the others was the need for, for more information and for more transparency. Um, but often the question is, how can we uh, present more information to consumers without overwhelming them? How can we do it in the, in the most simple way? And I, I think I'd like to turn to Raphael and ask a, a question around the, um, the digital trust mark, which uh, strikes um, us as a very novel approach uh, globally to addressing some of these um, information issues uh, and helping consumers identify trustworthy online um, businesses. Um, how, did the, uh, how did the idea for this um, mark come about and how are you planning to measure the impact? Thank you, Haim. Well, the digital trust, Profeco's digital trust mark is, the, is an extension of other programs that we have. We have like uh, Federico and Juan Camilo mentioned, uh, ODR and ADR, which uh, are very, uh, those mechanisms give uh, redress, immediate redress to consumers. So that they're pretty uh, long-standing programs from, for Profeco, Concilianet is a very uh, point of reference. But also we have other preventive programs from uh, focused on e-commerce, such as the commercial bureau and the uh, virtual store monitoring, which are uh, their consumers can see the commercial, the behavior of specific platforms and and e-stores and, uh, and you see if they're compliant with the law. So the, the trust mark is an extension of that. We also looked at our trust marks. We have in Mexico another trust mark from the Association Internet that's focused on security, uh, like digital security measures. And the Trust Europe, Trust E-commerce Europe uh, trust mark uh, so, uh, as references as well. Oh, as to how are we planning to measure the, the success? It's from an evaluation perspective, it's a little bit trickier to, to evaluate a preventive uh, program, but on the one side, we can, uh, from the supplier side, we can say that uh, to this day, we have uh, 36, 60 suppliers that have adopted uh, the digital trust market, the code of ethics in e-commerce. So that there has been an adoption from, from the supply side and from the demand side, uh, the, the, the idea is that the trust market has to be recognized by consumers and, and trusted. So that, that, that would be, a point that has to be evaluated and, and that uh, it's, it's an ongoing effort for consumers to recognize and trust the, the program. And uh, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, we, we, we will uh, develop uh, the program as, as it grows, hopefully. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sure lots of uh, the jurisdictions listening will find that all very interesting as they perhaps consider uh, introducing something similar. Um, I'd like to turn now to Antonino. Um, Antonino, you touched in your presentation on a number of 
uh, consumer um, issues uh, affecting um, those shopping on online marketplaces, such as um, product safety. Um, but is there uh, one particular area that stands out to Consumers International where um, very clearly consumers require more information? Is it, you know, identity of sellers? What is the low hanging fruit, if you like, that, that consumer uh, policymakers should really be looking at in, um, from consumer, Consumers International's perspective? Thank you, Thaim. Um, I think that um, I, I, I should start uh, or I should uh, answer your question by saying this. When a consumer engages in a transaction uh, through digital means, want to be sure that he will be protected, he will be informed before, during, and after, and he will have the possibility to solve any problem that that uh, transaction should have. So I will say that uh, this is the main concern of consumers. And, I, and you can say, well, OK, it's a lot of things. Yes, it's lots of things. But it can be uh, summarized as this thing that Federico and Rafael and Juan Camilo mentioned, and you mentioned too, which is trust. How you build trust. And you can build trust in a number of ways. And one of the prop, not problem, one of the things with trust is that if you lose trust, then regain trust is very difficult. So the things that each of, 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 of the presentation of Rafael and Federico and Juan Camilo and myself too were mentioned to, to I mean, to enhance, to construct and to build that trust is what us as consumer um, advocates and also consumers want. With a couple of uh, more common uh, comments. The first one is that um, we want to participate in the development of solutions. We are part of the game. We want to team up with governments, with businesses, with international organizations to uh, advance into those solutions. We recognize that a lot was done and is being done by government, by businesses. They both uh, uh, mentioned that in their presentation, but we want to be an active actor and part of that. We want to share our views and discuss and, and, and arrive to common, common positions. And finally, I think that we, when these, these issues, as I mentioned, even if they have uh, a specific um, solution or specific approach uh, in the national context, we don't have to forget that it has an international cross-border dimension. There, organizations like you, like OECD, and other international organizations are a need to play a stronger and, and, and and more, uh, they you have a very strong and, and, and active role, but enhance that because we need to. To one of the things that is still missing is that we uh, identify the problems, but we still need to advance more into the concrete solutions and the uh, implementation of that solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move to Federico now. Um, uh, Federico, uh, you touched a bit on um, uh, seller education um, and as well as consumer education, um, which are, are both uh, equally important, I think, um, from a, a marketplace's perspective. Um, what do you find are some of the key challenges um, that you're facing in making more information available to consumers, but also uh, to sellers, um, about um, their rights and responsibilities? Uh, about the products that um, are being listed, um, how can how how are you, what kinds of issues are you encountering? Is it is it difficult providing um, uh, a lot of information to consumers? How are you how are you managing that flow, if you like, to ensure that people are not overwhelmed and ignore? Thank you, Tini. Um, I think it's part of what you need to do as education with sellers. I mean, we do not provide information for the listing, that's the seller. So the key question is how can we um, make sellers 
um, build more robust uh, listings. I mean, um, TOA does go, as I said, as I mentioned before, if you compare a listing today, this a visa listing 10 or 15 years ago, it looks completely different. Uh, I think it's part of a, you know, of a, of a line, of a, of a streamline that we need to go through, uh, not only as a marketplace, but also working with the sellers. Um, of course, there is, the authorities are pushing towards more information, that's fine. Um, we believe that as more information the user has, a more um, sophisticated decision will be taken at the moment of making the purchase, but it does not only depend on us, it depends on the seller. So again, it's a matter of education or of um, having a system uh, more, let's say, uh, matured in terms of seller experience also. That's my view. Thank you very much. Um, just very finally, uh, I would just like to turn uh, back to the SIC. Um, if the deputy superintendent um, would be really interested to hear, uh, you noted that um, you were constrained by the current um, legislation in Colombia in, in um, putting together your guidelines. Are there any, um, is there any movement in Colombia to, to introduce any, any further legislation that might be impacting online marketplaces in future? What can we, can we expect? Um, from the Colombian uh, government in this space and how might you um, be working with online marketplaces to ensure that um, those best practices are identified and incorporated uh, in any future laws? Gracias. Thank you. In 2020, the National Planning Department together with a number of entities and agencies, including the Industry and Commerce Superintendency, worked on the electronic commerce uh, law. It's number 2020, if you want to check. It's called COMPASS. COMPASS makes a diagnosis of the current status of the state of the art on e-commerce in Colombia. Some deficiencies were found in consumer education, connectivity, logistics, transportation, things that become very important at the time of doing e-commerce transactions, among many other things. Well, now there is this very important movement driven by the national government, and that is to work in coordination with the various entities and agencies to achieve an update of legislation in Colombia so that it would fit the current times, which means a significant increase in purchasing through electronic means. Of course, as I said before, the role we have, the role we play in protecting the consumers means also being educators, educating the consumers and we are doing a lot of efforts in this regard so that we can somehow educate consumers. The national geography in Colombia is such that there are many differences in the regions and our role as the superintendency is to reach all consumers nationwide, to educate them, not only about their rights, but about their duties when doing e-commerce and also electronic transactions, of course. As to the second part of your question, important is to mention activities that we have conducted such as with Mercado Libre. Federico pointed out this. We have uh, undersigned an agreement with Mercado Libre whereby we can work together with vendors that do e-commerce so that a protection be given to consumers, a special protection. If we, and we want to continue working in this sense in many other areas through the COMPEX 
As I said, we're working with many agencies and entities to improve e-commerce activities. And the idea is not only to protect the, the rights of consumers, we also have to work on the uh, logistics, on the transportation of the merchandise that then is delivered, things like that. That's just an example. Also, we're working with the, the professional associations in order to distribute our guidelines that I mentioned before. The purpose is that consumers be educated, increasingly educated, and that consumers understand the current situation and that we also build trust because trust will have an impact on progress. And with trust, consumers will trust in an electronic platform when buying a product or when buying a service. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Um, that unfortunately brings us uh, to the end of our, our panel discussion today. Um, I'd like to thank all, all the panelists for your very uh, impressive um, contributions. It's been a, a pleasure to moderate and very interesting. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to all of the questions from the audience, but um, looking through them, uh, I think we did touch on a number of these themes. So hopefully uh, we've answered your questions. If, if you do have any anything you'd like to share, uh, with the organizers, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, the contact details uh, were on our agenda. Um, I think we've certainly generated a lot of ideas about what kinds of um, practices should be considered uh, best practices for online marketplaces to adopt in order to ensure that we have more empowered uh, consumers shopping on online marketplaces. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to uh, Camillo Rivera, who is the Director of the Innovation and Business Development Director at Columbia's Department uh, of national planning to, to provide some um, closing remarks for today's workshop. Camillo, you have the floor. Thank you, Time. I will switch to Spanish because of most of our attendants are uh, Spanish speakers now. So, thank you. I'm going to speak in Spanish. First of all, I'd like to thank the panel members who joined us in this workshop. I think their contributions were highly valuable. You have given us very relevant information about online markets, opportunities, challenges on the data portability, and all the new issues that come up with new channels and developments. I'd like to thank the moderators also who uh, were instrumental in a very key and uh, enjoyable discussion. I'd also like to thank all the participants that have been connected to this uh, webinar. And hopefully, our entities will continue holding discussions like this. We hope this has been beneficial for your work, for your companies, for your participants, and for all those who participate in this endeavor. I'd like to thank the uh, team of work of OECD the Consumer Policy Unit, including others. Uh, and if I forget a uh, division, uh, excuse me, I'd like to thank all of you. Also, the director, Alejandra Botero, for joining us in this webinar. Uh, now, as to general conclusions from this event, I'd like to highlight the first panel, Data Portability. Christian Reisbach talked about the report on the data portability. The results of this report speaks about the need to continue strengthening the importance of working on common standards and also about the interoperability on how to share data. We talked about technical topics such as how to improve all this. In addition, educate consumers about the importance of data portability and the creation of an intermediate market for portability with its inherent risks and challenges. Also, the importance of communication between regulators and online companies was established. As to the second panel, Pablo Marquez talked about the panel one, the portability of data in Colombia, in the financial sector. This uh, 
has an impact not only on competition, it's a topic that has to be further discussed. It is not executed outside of this current monitor scheme. There are security risks that have to be considered in the development of new services and in regulations. Then Pablo also highlighted that protection to the consumer allows development of portability in highly data intensive markets and sectors, not only in the financial sector, but in other sectors. Inge Graf referred to data portability initiatives in the, the European Union and the impact on competition. The frameworks developed to regulate portability have an impact on the consumers. From the European experience, it was highlighted the need to create an effective standard on portability that could be applied in different sectors. Also the need to mitigate the risks of undesirable effects. Finally, the importance of cooperation between regulators was highlighted also in the two panels. Also, we had the presentation by Viviana Vanegas about the national plan developed for data infrastructure in Colombia. They de are developing a governance model in Colombia. They highlighted that the plan wants to use data as infrastructure. Some principles were developed and there is a roadmap for the public sector to develop this model. Enabling data are required to be used in the digital ecosystem and also uh, mechanisms for citizen participation are to be implemented. Furthermore, there was an analysis made of the use of data. The plan is the first step to move towards interoperability in Colombia through very clear guidelines and safe for data managers and users. Then the Moonshot project was uh, presented. It started in 2020 with the leadership of this Colombian Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the project was outlined, including they want to assess the value of data for all the stakeholders, the economic and social value. They want to uh, drive innovation through the use of data by companies, develop new business models through the data management approach and to empower consumers in the use of data. A challenge in this project has been to balance innovation and data protection. The good use of data is key and should build trust in consumers and make consumers to be more willing, culturally speaking, to share data. Then in the second panel, uh, Hugh Stevenson made a review of the work done by uh, OECD in the online markets efforts to address the challenges and the good practices, provide very valuable tools to assess the application of those in this context. The importance of a dialogue between regulators and online markets, and the dialogue points out the need to uh, generate better products for the consumers. In addition, the experiences of Mexico and Colombia were presented from different points of view all aimed at providing uh, protection and security to consumers. Juan Camilo Duran from Colombia, the deputy superintendent for the protection of consumers, talked about the relevance of education for consumer protection in the digital world. And also talked about the importance of educating those who use the social networks. He mentioned the influencers, the role, and also final consumers. Activities should be developed to improve e-commerce transactions in a safe environment. And also he presented the guidelines that they have developed uh, for consumer education. Then Rafael Regla from Mexico talked about the importance of developing ethical frameworks. Uh, these uh, frameworks may be adopted by companies as a um, trust, uh, mark, for instance, or digital trust mark. As to product safety, Antonio Serra then from Consumers International presented the guideline uh, for security of uh, online products, for safety, sorry, of online products. He talked about the safety of products offered through uh, digital means 
and how it is done in conventional markets. Last but not least from companies, many other topics should be analyzed, such as the challenges, consumer guidelines and international efforts. Also, the strategies for solving conflicts should be enhanced and streamlined. Governments should do their part in regulations, such as the work done by the Superintendency for Industry and Commerce in Colombia. Well, we um, also enjoyed the presentation made by Mercado Libre. Uh, these in general terms are the main aspects discussed today. Again, I'd like to thank all the participants, uh, panel members, and organizers that made this uh, webcast possible. This is the end of our workshop on portability of data and consumer protection in online markets. We'll continue working to learn more about these um, markets through innovative strategies for its development. Thanks again for your participation and have a good day, everybody.